everybody. How was y'all Sunday afternoon? Good. I'm glad to hear that. Anybody get a nap? Hey, we got we got a few naps. I did not get one. I laid down, but I didn't go to sleep. So, yeah. Um, we're going to start off tonight's service with number 444. I've got a mansion. Number 444. Let's stand as we sing. It's a wonderful place. It's real, and one day we're going to be there. God bless you for being here tonight. Let's open up in prayer. Lord, thank you so much for the song we just sang, and Lord, it's good to sing about the place that you promised to prepare for us. Lord, you said if you go away, you prepare a place, and one day you're going to come back and receive us unto yourself, that where you are, there will be also. Lord, thank you so much for that, and Lord, thank you for the great day we've had in your house today. What a blessing it's been just to be here, to be in your presence, to be amongst the people of God. And Lord, we thank you that you'll just bless 
your word again tonight, the music. May everything that's done tonight, Lord, lift up the name of Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Well, God's been good today, hasn't he? Amen. He's always good. And I'm glad you're here tonight. And God bless you. How about this? How about somebody standing and give us a word of testimony real quick tonight? Just real quickly. Just want to thank God for something in your life. Anybody? Just real quick. Just, uh, yes, sir, brother. Yes, I just want to thank God for putting up with me. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. If I was in his shoes, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put up with half of what he had. Yeah. But he's <laughs> Amen. Amen. I saw another hand here. Yes, sir, brother. Amen. Amen. That's exactly right. I tell you what, God knows what we need when we need it. Amen. Amen. Somebody else got a word of testimony? Anybody? Real quick. Yes, ma'am. Amen. 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 That's right. That's right. That's right. Anybody else something on your heart? Yes, I heard somebody. Yes, go right ahead. Yes, ma'am. Go right ahead. I just wanted to give God praise and thanks, number one, for my salvation for saving my precious soul, but also most recently for just being a comfort and a strength in my head every day. Amen. God's so good. He's so good. All right. Let me just go over just a couple of things here, and, and uh, then we'll move along with the service. We got some, uh, just uh, I want you to look over your bulletin when you get a chance. I'm not going to go over all of these announcements like we did this morning, but if you uh, just keep your bulletin close by and just read it, and uh, you'll stay up to date with everything that's going on. And so um, uh, just keep all that in mind. But for as far as this week is concerned, don't forget our security training class at 9 o'clock in the morning on the 27th. That's uh, this coming Saturday. And then Saturday, also our Lamp Lighters Fellowship. So that's going on this week, and just keep all that in mind. All right, our choir is going to sing right now at this time. And uh, Mike is going to lead our choir. Hopefully he'll lead it all this summer if he don't give up on it. And so uh, tonight's his first night on doing that. And so... Uh, Pray for him and then pray for the choirs we sing. All right.
right, number 120 will be our second hymn tonight. 120, Calvary covers it all. Praise the Lord, it does. All of our sin, all of our mess ups. Let's stand as we sing, Calvary covers it all. seated and uh, we're going to have a little bit of prayer right now and and uh, brother Jerry do you mind coming up and praying for us if you would sir and uh, while he's coming let me give you a uh, two or three new requests here uh, found out today Mr. John Sorensen is down with his back tonight and so please pray for him um, Kinsley Lewis, her surgery's Thursday, all right? So let's don't forget little Miss Kinsley here. She's getting her adenoids and all her tonsils, I guess. Oh, no, 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 no. She's getting the ear, the, the tubes in her ears, all right? So uh, let's remember Kinsley. And then I heard uh, Brother Larry say that Marcia's down, and she's sick tonight and going to the doctor tomorrow. And then we had all of those that we mentioned this morning. So remember those, if you would. Mr. Bill Harrison also is getting a PET scan tomorrow and finding out how progressed his cancer is now. So uh, please pray for Mr. Bill Harrison. All right. Uh, let's just go to the Lord in prayer right now. And Brother Jerry, if you'll pray for us. And right after he prays, Brother Timmy Ellis is going to sing for us. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's been a good day, Lord. We just thank you for our brother and sister that came here amongst us to minister to us. And Father, we pray your blessing upon them and protection upon them as they travel. And Lord, thank you for all the blessings you give us, your mercy, your love. And Lord, thank you for, above all, for the Savior, Jesus Christ, who came and died in our place on Calvary and purchased salvation for us. And Lord, we pray for the needs of mention here. Father, we pray you would touch and heal and comfort, Lord, and protect. And Lord, we pray for our country. Lord, that America would turn from thee, from, from to thee, Lord, and turn from the evil that it so easily, and, and, and Lord, that we seem to endure so, so happily, Lord. And Father, we pray for you be with the speaker, be with Brother Timmy as he bring, uh, bring forth the song. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. i 
turn to sing now. We'll sing one more chorus tonight. It'll be Christ is all I need. Just wait for mama to get back to the piano. <laughs> Christ is all I need. It's number 221 if you need the words. Christ is all I need. Christ is all Today's just been a wonderful day today, and I, I appreciate everything that's going on, and I'm so thankful that God has just sent us the man that he has, and, and, the, and, the, and his wife as well, both of them working as a team together to serve God. By the way, that's the best way to serve God, is just with your whole family, just as a team together, and it's just so wonderful just to have him and his wife both, and and God's just really blessed us today with a wonderful day. I'm going to ask uh, Miss Pierce if she would come right now. And uh, wasn't that a blessing, those songs she sung today? Amen. Amen. And she's going to come and sing a song right now, and I'm looking forward to it. So, Miss Pierce, if you just come and you just uh, bless our hearts, more importantly, bless the heart of God tonight as you sing, right? Okay. <laughs> That's okay. She can drink her husband's water. That's fine. All right. All right. <laughs> She's got a mic. Okay, gotcha. Thank you again for having us. <clears throat> it's been such a blessing to Greg and I both, and y'all have been so kind and so sweet. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts. <clears throat> Crossing the calm sea with Jesus, the disciples were getting concerned. The wind started violently blowing, but he was asleep in the stern. Does he not care that we? 
we perish. We're helpless and we're so afraid. Jesus arose when they called him and said to them, Where is your faith? Because you prayed all night. Because you held on with all of your might. Child, your cries have woken the master. Oh, we know your voice. Lift your hands, it's time to rejoice. Child, Trials of your life have begun. Seek no hope in the distance. You're frightened and nowhere to run. Now your vessel is filling. You're thinking that you're surely drowned. You cried out for help from the Savior. And you know. She said, just sing one. I wouldn't mind if she sang that one again. I tell you what, God is good, isn't he? I tell you what, you know what? There's nothing like lifting up the name of Jesus. And you know a lot of songs, you just don't know what they're singing about. But I tell you, when it just speaks of Jesus and it uplifts him, I love that. I love that. I tell you, I, 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 I don't, y'all can come back anytime. Just bring her with you, okay? <laughs> All right, and uh, brother, what a blessing it's been, and uh, this morning it was just, uh, I think, there weren't much dry eyes in the whole church this morning, and uh, I'm so thankful that God knows exactly what we need, and uh, Brother Pierce, I'm so glad God sent you our way, I really am, and uh, you, uh, you don't need an introduction now, brother, you just come on, you just preach to us, and preach to us as whatever God lays on your heart. And I know it'll be exactly what we need, brother. God bless you. Amen. Amen. I heard Jack Hiles years ago preach a simple sermon. All of his sermons are so simple. And uh, is your Lord sleeping? And it's right along the text that Mary was just singing about. And I think he says the way he brought it out, uh, 
The Lord really wasn't asleep. It says he was asleep in the back of the boat, but he knew what was going on, just like I preached about this morning. It's so good to be with you. And, uh, you know, Mary and I have been in so many churches. We've been in black churches, white churches, Chinese, with the Chinese people, Russian, the Kazakhs. We've been in Germany, France, and even Canada. I guess the most stoic churches I've ever preached in is I preached a crusade up in Canada years ago. And those people don't amen. They don't ever clap their hand. They don't raise their hand. And, uh, but the Lord blessed us up there. We had a real good meeting years ago in Canada. And it's so good to be here. Everywhere we go, it seems like we're adopted or we're brought into the family. It seems like we're part of the family. And if you're not part of the church, the local church, you're living beneath your privilege as a human being not to be part of a local church. And no matter where you go in the world, you'll find other Christians, and you might have a few doctrinal things you disagree. Me and Mary has doctrinal disagreements, uh, but uh, uh, you're still in the family. And it's such a blessing to be in the family. You know, there's three ways to get into a family. Uh, by nature, I was not in the family of God. Not by nature. I was in Adam's family. You know, the Adam's family, they're creepy and spooky and altogether <laughs> kooky. But there's another way. You're either born into a family or you can marry into a family. I married into the family. Mary's the youngest of nine children. Now, it's hard to marry the youngest. Her four brothers, one at a time, came to me 50 years ago when we were courting. And they said, if you don't take good care of my baby sister, I'm coming after you. And I graduated from the FBI Academy. I mean, I was a tough guy. And they said, so I've taken good care of her all these years. And I, you can marry into the family. Uh, that's not the same as being born into a family. You know, there's a difference in in-laws and outlaws. You know, outlaws are wanted, right? And then you can be adopted into a family. And I thank God I was adopted Amen. into God's family Amen. through my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And an adopted child has all the legal rights of a natural child. Right. When we adopted, our, we have a, two, uh, a girl we adopted when she's two years old, horribly abused child. And uh, she's re mentally retarded. She's in a group home in Jefferson, South Carolina. And we get her every weekend. And uh, it's good for her to be in that group home, though. She's in her 30s now. But, you know, uh, the lawyers told us at the final adoption, you can never unadopt a child. And the lawyer's name was uh, Judge Cohen. And, you know, uh, the Cohens, that's the Levites. That's the Jewish tribe of Levite, the priestly class. And he said, do you understand when I sign these papers and you adopt this child, you can never disinherit adopted child. Yeah, I know that because I know what eternal security is about. And I want to thank you that you adopted us into your family. I want you to take your Bibles tonight and go to a familiar scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And go down to verse 3, and the Bible says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, whom the God, in my King James Bible, that's a little tiny G there, that's not my God, whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them." I was a director of Southern Baptist Missions years ago in Hinesville, Georgia. We had churches, mostly country churches, a few larger churches, but we were in five Georgia counties. And again, I don't know if you understand how we work as Southern Baptists, but uh, I have no authority over the church. I can't tell the church what to do. Wish I could, but they're not going to listen to me anyhow. You know, they say you get old enough, you got the answers, but nobody will listen to you. But uh, I have no authority of the church. I try to coordinate things, try to get them stirred up and interested in missions. I do this in Chesterfield County in South Carolina with 65 or 66 churches now, counting the prison ministry. 
But uh, I try to be the pastor to the pastors and uh, try to help them out. Well, when I was in Hinesville, Georgia, south of Savannah, my association went over to the Savannah. South of Savannah, if you look on the map, there's a little tiny town called Crescent, Georgia. And Crescent's a poor little fishing town. There are commercial crabbers and commercial uh, shrimpers down there. A poor little town. They didn't have a pastor. They asked me, they said, would you fill in for us for a while while we look for a pastor? And I said, I'd be delight delighted to. And so we drove about 40 miles from our home in Hinesville over to Crescent. And I preached there in that little tiny church, poor community. And going out the door, there was a, a young lady, a very attractive young lady, and she was crying copious tears, shaking our hands. And she said, do you have time to talk with me? And I said, sure. Sit on the pew after everybody goes before I lock up. Mary and I will sit and talk to you. We'll have all day, whatever's necessary. We sat there with that young girl, and in her tears, she started telling us her life story. She said, I was saved here in this church. I was raised up very, very poor. She said, I was baptized in that baptistry right there. And she said, as time went on, the Lord blessed me and gave me a wonderful, handsome Christian husband that loved me with all of his heart. And she said, in our union together, we had a precious little boy. Now, you've got to understand, she's crying, she's trembling, and we're trying to console her and listen to her. And she said, but you know, my husband was a, a shrimper, and hard times came, and she said, I didn't want to, but I had to get a job to help pay our bills. And she said, I went to work. And she said, after a while, I kind of liked that. I'd never done that before, but the men at work would flirt with me and tell me how pretty I was, and it made me feel important. And she said, one thing led to another. There was one young man at work that would eat lunch with me, and things got more and more involved, and she's crying by now, and she's really carrying on, and we're being patient with her. And she said that one thing led to another, and she said, I had an adulterous relationship with the man at work. And my husband, when he found out about it, he put me out. I had no place to go. I moved in with my new boyfriend, uh, me and my little boy. And she said, but the law, the cops were watching the house because he was dealing drugs out of the house. And she said, recently, the cops came in and arrested my boyfriend. Family Children's Services had taken our, my little boy. And she said, I can't even live without my son. And I have lost everything. And she said, now my husband is going to take, go to court to take my son away from me. And she said, I mean, you've got to understand, the more she would talk, the worse it would get. And this went on 30 or 45 minutes, and she's crying and crying, and she's trembling and shaking. And she said, now they're going to take me to court and take my little boy away. I have no home. They put my husband and my boyfriend in prison because of doing drugs. And she said, then she popped the question. And you know what the question is. Why would God let something like this happen to me? Well, now my wife, she's as sweet as apple pie. Mary is always just like you've seen her this weekend. Uh, she does have some times when she loses it, and it ain't pretty. <laughs> and Mary, after 45 minutes of this, and that girl said, why would God let something like this happen to me? Mary slapped that pew, and she said, wait just a minute here. Don't you blame my God for you messing your life up the way you did. Now, you know, brother, every now and then your wife comes up with something pretty good. And I thought, that make a good sermon. Don't blame my God for what happens in this world. Don't blame my God if you're messing up your life and destroying your life or your marriage the way you do. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you, Father, for the family. We thank you, Father, the family here and people, Father, that have taken us in, though we strangers, they took us in because of Jesus Christ. And Father, our common love for the word of God and our Savior. 
I pray, Father, you'll teach us this doctrinal message tonight. The Lord may straighten out a lot of our wonders and doubts in a lot of our Bible. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Now, as I get older, there's not many things that really bother me like when I was younger. You know, uh, Jesus had three close disciples, Peter, James, and John, and that's the three phases of my life. When I was a young man, I was Peter. I was real impetuous. I'm always ready to fight. I'm the first one that would speak out and, and probably sometimes speak out a turn like Peter would. But in my middle years there, I settled down. I was like James. Now, James is very studious. He's a very introspective person. He says, don't just tell me about your faith. Show me your faith. And that's when I did a lot of study in my middle years. I mean, I went from Peter always flying off the handle, ready to chop somebody's head off or their ear off or whatever, and to James. And now to Mary's advantage, I've become John the Beloved. I've got much more grace dealing with people now than I did uh, back when I was younger. Say amen right there, Mary. <laughs> but you know, not many things bother me. Now the world's just the opposite. The world gets all upset over CNN and FOX and MSNBC and all that new stuff and everybody wants to know what's Pelosi has to say or what Camelia Harris is doing about it what is uh, Obama have to say in the background and what's going on with this and that and what's Biden saying I've listened to him and I still wonder what's he saying <laughs> you know and the world gets all upset over all the news and all these things I don't get as upset in fact it somewhat amuses me because I know my Bible I mean come on folks Put away your Prozac and save your blood pressure pills and stop getting so upset over something the Bible says is going to happen anyhow. Amen. But you know, most of what the world says, it don't bother me much anymore. But I'll tell you, there is one thing that really gets me upset. There's one thing that gets me, makes my blood pressure rise and makes my brow perspire. And I got a pretty good brow. And that is when people want to blame my God for everything that goes wrong in this world. Friend, listen, don't blame my God. Every time something goes wrong, everybody wants to blame my God for it. I mean, don't blame my God. You know, God gets the blame for just about everything that happens. And yet if something goes right, if something goes good, God never gets the credit. Man takes their credit. Look what we've done. Look what we've cured. Look at what we've invented. Look what we've explored. Well, I've just about had it anymore. When somebody wants to blame my God for the ills of this world, I'll tell them right to their face, don't blame my God. He's not the one that's at fault. I'll break this into three or four categories. In the first place, the world says, if God's a God of love and all that, why do so many people suffer in this world? It must be God's fault. Why is there so much violence in this world? Why does God allow wars and murders and death and cancers and atrocities? Why would a loving God allow such a thing to happen? Friend, don't blame my God for that. In Genesis chapter 3, by the time we get to just the third chapter of Genesis, everything is going good, by the way. Your common ancestors, Adam and Eve, our common grandparents were living in bliss. They were living in the Garden of Eden. They had absolutely no wants, no needs, no problems. And yet when you get to chapter three, the God of this world, that's Satan, he comes into the garden and messes everything up. Man had a God that loved him. Man had a God that fellowshiped with him, that walked with him in the garden, that provided every need, took care of every want, every desire. He lacked nothing. Yet with Adam's eyes wide open, he chose that other God, the God of this world, old Satan. The Bible said Adam was not deceived being in the transgression. The woman was deceived. We give Eve a hard time about this, but the Bible says plainly and clearly that the woman was deceived, that Adam was not deceived being in the transgression. You see, Adam, Eve had taken of that forbidden fruit. 
She disobeyed the father, went against God's word. And when she ate that forbidden fruit, she changed. I mean, she had death written on her face. And there stands Adam in his glorified body. And he knew exactly what was going to happen when he took of that forbidden fruit and disobeyed God. And yet he chose death for his bride, like my Savior Jesus Christ did. He was given a choice, and he chose that other God. And when he did, Adam learned seven new words for his vocabulary. You know, Adam must have been a pretty smart guy. God brought him all the animals. He named them. There's 5,500 mammals alone. There's 8,600 different birds. He named every one of them. Not to count the fish and the fowl and insects and everything else. He must have been a pretty smart fella. But he learned seven new words in his vocabulary when he sinned against the holy, righteous God. He learned the word curse and sorrow and thorns and sweat and death and nakedness and the sword over and over and over in my Bible, you'll find man raises an angry fist and shakes it at God Almighty. And he says, I have none of you. I'm choosing the God of this world, old Satan. The Bible says in Joshua 24 and 15, I wish you wouldn't do that. Choose you this day whom you'll serve, whether the God your father served on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me, in my house, we'll choose the Lord. John 3 and 8, it said, The devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Well, come on. If Jesus said there's works of the devil, he must be up to something. What are the devil's works? Obviously, if he said the devil has works, what is he doing? He set out to destroy. He'll destroy the church. He'll destroy the testimony of godly men. The devil will do all he can to bring you down. He'll destroy your little family if you give him any slack. In Psalms 106, 35, it said they mingled among the heathen and learned their works. Yea, their sons and their daughters were sacrificed unto devils. Just like in America today, people are sacrificing their sons and daughters to the devil. And yet when they turn out bad, they want to blame my God for it. Secondly, I was, people are going to ask, why does God allow us child abuse? Why did he allow that little baby we adopted 30-something years ago to be burned and to be beaten and thrown out like a stray? I wouldn't even throw out a stray like that. Our daughter, Joey, we documented in court almost 30 cigarette burns on her plus other cuts and we subpoenaed to court 12 different girls from a poor trailer park that took that baby in because if they had more children, they'd get more public assistance. Now her mother put her out like a stray and left with the outlaw motorcycle gang from Florida. Why would God, if God's got a love, why would he let somebody do a child like that? Why do you hear so much about perversion in the home place? Why do you hear so much about perversion in the schools and teachers molesting children. Why is it parents are fearful to drop their children off at daycare centers anymore? I'll tell you because a long time ago, America chose that other God. They made a decision. They would not follow the Lord God that loved them. Friend, don't blame my God. My God never abused or molested a child. My God Never treated a child like that. My God loved little children. Amen. Remember the disciples pushed him away and said, Jesus, don't have time for them. And he suffered, said, suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know how your God treats you, but in spite of the problems we've been through, my God's been awful good to me. Amen. My God has taken good care of me. You say, if God's a God of love and righteousness, why is all this perversion going on in America today? And now it's so popular, children and young people and 
don't even know what gender they are. Folks, I'll be honest with you. I am not a scientist. I'm not a biologist. But I worked a year on a dairy milking 500 heads of cows. We had two varieties, maybe three. We had bulls and we had cows. That was it. Now, if you castrated one of the bulls, you had a steer. You didn't have another cow. And I may be ignorant, but I'll tell you, I can tell the difference. I worked on a dairy. And we have people graduating with doctor's degrees or master's degrees that don't even know what I'm talking about. Don't blame my God for all this confusion in the universities and the public schools. People say, well, preacher, I don't know why. There's an epidemic of emotional distress nowadays. Anxiety, despair, psychological trauma. Well, don't blame my God for that. Acts 10, 38, and God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost, with power, who went about doing good and healing all that would are oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. If somebody has some kind of demonic problem, don't blame my God for it. Jesus went about healing them. Don't you remember the story of the maniac of Gadara? Jesus went over there and that maniac, they said, he wear no clothes. Uh, he take his clothes off. You show me someone, I don't care if it's Wilmington Beach or, or Myrtle Beach, can't keep their clothes on. That's demon possession. He wore no clothes. He cried with a loud voice. I was sitting in traffic and they pulled up next to me. Had their wolfers and tweeters blaring at 200 watts. It's wonder they didn't give, get a nosebleed. Crying with a loud voice. My God, the Holy Spirit is a spirit of peace. God's children like peace. He cut himself with stones. Nowadays, young people are mutilating their own body with drugs and all this other kind of perversion. But it said when he met Jesus, first he saw him a great way off and he ran and he fell at his feet and worshiped him. And the story ends, he's sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Don't blame my God for all the psychological perversion going on in America today. You see, that maniac, his God wasn't my God. Same as the prodigal son. Product son wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, he joined himself to a citizen of that country and sent him into the field to feed swine. He fain would have filled his belly with the swine, with what the swine did eat. And it said, when he came to himself, it's like he's out, that boy's out of his mind. And suddenly he came to himself. It's like a light went on. He said, I'll arise and go to my father and say, Father, I've sinned against thee. And my father, and against thee, make me as one of the hired servants. And he arose and went. Friend, don't blame my God for all the psychological problems in the world today. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 1, 7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but the spirit of adoption. In Romans it says, Wherefore I we cry, Abba, Father. Well, then folks say, I just don't understand why the world has all these wars. In rumors of wars, Jesus said, See, ye be not troubled, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. Hosea 11 and verse 1 said, When Israel was a child, I loved him. That's my God. I called my son out of Egypt. That's my God. He goes on to say, I took him by his hands and taught Israel how to walk. That's my God. And I fed him and took care of him. But they went into the cities and the sword was upon them. Why was the sword upon Israel? Because they turned against my God and their God. They chose the wrong God. They chose the Assyrian. Always a type and picture of the Antichrist and the God of this world. You say, Brother Greg, you've been all over. Why is there so much trouble in Croatia and Somalia? Why is there so much trouble in Ethiopia? What's this thing between Ukraine and Russia? Why is there such violence and oppression in North Korea and China? 
was there famine and starvation and atrocities and abject poverty? Could it be in 1917, Russia was known as a Christian nation. They were Orthodox, but they were known as a Christian nation. But in 1917, in the Bolshevik Revolution, the Russian people, they rose up and threw out God Almighty out of that country. I stood and collected form villages after villages after villages, sometimes nine times a day. And 600 people would come and wait four hours to hear the word of God preached. They had never seen a Bible before. I saw old Bobbish go in and take a Bible. I'd give it to them. And they'd hug it and kiss it and weep. But they threw out God in 1917. And it gave communism, brought them communism and starvation and Stalin executing 30 million people. He had lined men up three deep so they wouldn't waste bullets. They could shoot all, through all, all three of them. My two daughter-in-law's grandparents, all four were in the gulags in Siberia. You know what their crime was? They were Christians. Why does that happen? Don't blame my God for that. In 1969, Holly Selassie was the emperor of Ethiopia in East Africa. He was known as the Christian emperor. By the way, the last Christian emperor. 1969, Holly Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, contacted the Bible Baptist College in Springfield, Missouri, and he said, I want you to send me three men, Beecham Vick, Bill uh, Dow, and Fred Donaldson. Can you imagine being a preacher and being invited to the emperor in Ethiopia? He said, I'll buy their tickets. I'll do their visas. I need these men to come to me. And he told those three preachers from Springville, I'm going to lose my country to communism. He said, I have brought Ethiopia into the golden era. We paved streets, we built hospitals, we built schools, we built churches. We are Christian nations, but the communists are trying to take over Ethiopia. Send me a hundred missionary couples. I'll give them a place to stay, pay their expenses. And a few went, a few went. But friend, in 1974, Ethiopia chose Marxist, Leninist communism, and now they're in starvation. Now they're in disease. They're riddled in, with epidemic of AIDS. Hundreds of thousands of orphans in that country because of AIDS. They're in violence. Nearly uh, half a million orphans in Ethiopia. You say, why would God let a thing happen like that? Friend, they threw out Holly Selassie, they threw out Christianity, and they embraced socialism and communism just like America is doing today. Now they show pictures, they would show pictures on my television of starving little African kids and covered with flies, and their bellies are protruding from starvation, and the little knees are knobby because they have rickets. And they want me to feel sorry for them, and it breaks my heart. But don't you blame my God for that. That's what the God of this world does. You serve my God, you'll give, get what my God can give you. You serve the God of this world, you'll get what the devil can give you. And there's nothing in between. God don't treat people like that. Somalia, 1959, threw out the last Christian missionary out of that country. There hasn't been one since. In India, they're throwing out missionaries now. And now they have filth and disease and parasites and starvation. You say their God didn't treat his children very well. Yeah, their God don't treat them very well. But my God treats me real good. My God's been treating, spoiling me like an only child. Amen. In spite of the fact that Mary and I go through the same problems and troubles that anybody else does. Let me explain it to you this way. Just because you're a Christian does not make you exempt from problems in your life. 
You know, a mosquito will bite a Christian just as well as he will a lost person. You know, you roll in poison ivy. I don't care how saved and sanctified you are. You're going to get poison ivy same as a lost person. A rattler, timber rattle, or strike a lost person same as he will a child of God. It makes no difference. You're going to have to go through the same problems. But thank God for my God. If you reject God's blessings, reject God's message, reject God's truth, if you reject God's word, if you're choosing that God of this world, say, I like him better. The Lord says, I wish you wouldn't do that. I'll plead with you. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. Come unto me, all you labored and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. And you say, I reject that. I don't want my, that you're God, Greg. I'll choose the God of this world. Okay, it's your choice. I believe in absolute free will. And so a quarter of a million die in Chinese earthquakes. We were in Borneo when that happened. 227,000 die in Sumatra, 30,000 in Iran. 86,000 died in Pakistan in an earthquake. 20,000 in India in 2001. 225,000 in India when a tsunami hit the coast. Don't blame my God for that. You choose the God of this world, you worship the devil, you go for the devil, and I'm going to tell you, you get what the devil can give you. So preacher, then why are the drive-by murders, gangs, all this killing? John 8, 44, said, you are of your father the devil, and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there's no truth in him. You want to know why there's so much crime and violence in America? First of all, it's because we're in the last days, friends, and those things have been prophesied, 24 prophecies in Matthew 24. Sometime when I come, maybe I'll preach all 24 of them to you. But they're being fulfilled before your very eyes, and a lot of people can't even see it. See, people are just talking about the wrong God. You're not talking about my God. You're talking about the God of this world. I was in Arkansas as a director of missions over there and crossed at Arkansas on the Louisiana border. I had three pastors who were died in the wool Calvinist. If you don't know what Calvinist is, it's getting more and more popular in Baptist circles. They believe that you are so totally depraved, you can't even pray and ask Jesus Christ to save you. That's total depravity. They believe that Jesus Christ only died for a select few, where God arbitrarily, not because you trust him or anything, arbitrarily elects these people and those people, and this one and that one. Strange thing, brother, every Calvinist I ever met was elected, and their family. They believe in irresistible grace. If the Holy Spirit tells you to get saved, you cannot say no. My Bible says, quench not the spirit, resist not the spirit. Grieve not the spirit. But I was in one of these churches about this size, maybe a little larger, and a Calvinist pastor who was a friend of mine. There was a big shooting out there in Arizona. There was a country and western concert. And if you remember a guy, his name was Roland. He got up in a hotel there and mowed down a whole bunch of people. I'm talking about a bunch of them. That was on a Tuesday. That Wednesday, I was in the church. And the pastor, he said, who killed those people last night. Somebody said, well, the devil. He said, no, you're wrong. You're wrong. He said, who killed those people? I spoke up and I said, I think his name was Roland. He said, no, Brother Greg, you're wrong. You're wrong. He said, God killed those people. He said, didn't God know it was going to happen? Well, of course. Didn't, uh, couldn't God, isn't he all powerful? Couldn't he have stopped it? Well, yes, of course. So God killed those people. That's the reasoning of the Calvinists. You know what that pastor's problem was? He was blaming my God for the devil's work. I don't understand why innocent people are killed, Brother Greg. I don't understand why people get hurt. Good godly people 
like some in your family come down with cancer or Alzheimer's, such a cruel disease. Scott Matthews, a friend of our family, has a little niece right now in the hospital named Chloe. And Chloe may not come out of that hospital alive. Why, that little Chloe Rochester can't get over this. Is it cancer she has, Mary? And that little baby's head shaved and already scarred and they're putting on ventilators and why these things happen. Why do the innocent suffer? That's the question you've been waiting for. Hebrews 2.14, you better write it down. You're going to need it someday. Hebrews 2.14, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. Everybody in this room, you're a partaker of flesh and blood. You're here in the flesh or else we wouldn't even be able to see each other, right? For as much as you are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that hath power over death. That is the devil. As long as you're in this body, you're going to, as long as you're partakers of flesh and blood, as long as you're in this body, you're subject to what Adam brought on us. Now, if you don't want to blame the devil, at least blame Adam. Adam gets off scot-free. The devil gets off scot-free. And my God gets blamed for everything that happens. Don't blame my God. My friend, if you're chosen of one of God's people, if you ask Jesus Christ to save you, even though you're in this body, you're still going to have problems. In John chapter 9, I believe it is, they found a man born blind. They asked Jesus, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, neither did this man or his parents sin, but that the Son of God may be made manifest. There's three reasons right there people have infirmities. Could be their parents. Our daughter, adopted daughter, is retarded because her mother was a heroin addict when she was carrying that baby. It wasn't Joey's fault. Sometimes, and some of you and some of us, may have infirmities because we, of our own sins, things we bring on ourselves. Sometimes it's for the glory of God so he might heal you. And I'm an example standing before you right now here tonight. Sometimes you have infirmities and sickness to humble you. That's what the apostle Paul said. I had an infirmity of the flesh and I asked God three times to heal me and the Lord never healed him from it so that he might be humbled. Sometimes you have infirmities and tragedies because of violence of other men. There are people up in Chicago this weekend walking the streets. Somebody, it'll be on the news tomorrow, drive by and shoot them. The violence of other men, they didn't do anything wrong. They're victims. But friend, listen, through it all, don't blame my God. Seven new words from our old common grandfather, Adam, when he sinned against the holy, righteous God. Years ago, I heard a story back in the days, uh, colonial days, actually, when people drive, traveled by carriage. Let me back up a little bit. There was three teenage boys, kind of rowdy, Rascals of boys. They heard a tent revival was going on in Boston, Massachusetts. They thought, I will go and heckle the preacher and break up the revival. And they did, and they started heckling George Whitfield, the great Anglican preacher that was preaching there in Boston. But one of the boys named Robert Robinson, just 19 years old, fell under such conviction Robert Robertson gave his heart and soul to Jesus Christ at 19. At 21 years old, he had already answered the call to preach. And that young man became a mighty man of God in his early 20s. But there was a refined lady years past, and she was traveling by carriage from Boston to Philadelphia. And she was a refined Christian lady sitting in that carriage alone. And they stopped outside of Boston and Cambridge and they picked up an old derelict of a drunk of a man. 
and it made the lady real nervous. He sat across from her, staring at her, and in her nervousness, she started humming an old hymn. Come thy fount of ever blessing. Tune thy heart to sing, my heart to sing thy praise. She asked that old derelict, she said, sir, are you familiar with the song that I'm singing? He said, ma'am, I am the poor, miserable wretch that wrote that song many, many years ago. And he said, I'd give a thousand worlds if I had them to have the Spirit of God on me today that I had back when I was a 20-something-year-old young preacher. You know, there's a line of that song that says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Are you prone to wander from God? Then don't blame my God for the ills of this world. When you turn on the news tomorrow, or you hear of a tragedy, or something's diagnosed in your own family, please don't blame my God. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for loving us. Like one of the men giving testimonies tonight, putting up with us, sinners that we are. Lord, I look at my own life. I see no redeeming qualities in my life that you would care so much, except for I trust myself, my soul, my future, my family, to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for the Bible you put in my hand and in my heart. Thank you, Lord, for the Word of God that we've seen so many people never even saw a copy of it in all of their life. Thank you, Lord, for a little girl that wrote to us one time from a, in Russia and said, if you can't send me a Bible in Russian language, send me one page. And out in that same village, if you're gone, Father, we saw the Holy Spirit fall. Just when they had one Bible or one page of the Bible, and yet we take this word, Father, you give us so much for granted. Forgive us of our sins. Bless this church, this sweet pastor and his wife. Drop a few hands full on purpose along the way to keep them encouraged. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Brother Pierce. Thank you so much. Let's grab your hymn book right now. Brother Mike, Mike what are we going to sing? What's that now? 301, 301. Would you turn to your Bibles there? 300, not Bibles, but your songbooks, 301. And let's stand together. You know, I'm glad that, that we serve a God that... Go ahead and stand if you would, and we'll be ready to sing here in just a second. I'm glad that our God never mistreats His children. God doesn't mistreat anybody. God treats us completely perfect because we have a perfect God. He's completely perfect. Do you know what? Sometimes we can get disillusioned in our minds. I'm reminded of us going door to door, Brother, Brother Paul back here. And I remember going to the door, a man coming to the door and we invited him to church, and he just blamed God for the death of his wife who had Legarrette's disease. And she was, uh, he said it was a, she was a good person, and why God would let that happen. Listen, God, God doesn't do that. Listen, I'm so thankful that we have a God that we can turn to. And we're all going to go through tough times. We will. But don't blame it on my God. Amen. Amen. Wonderful truth. Wonderful truth we need to be reminded about. Maybe you just need to come around the altar tonight and just pray for somebody. Maybe they're going through a tough time tonight. Maybe they're disillusioned. And uh, they need God just to reveal Himself to them. And maybe tonight you just want to gather around the altar and pray for somebody you know that, you know what, there's power in prayer. There is. And maybe tonight that's what we need to do is pray for these that, that are discouraged, disillusioned, and just ask the Lord just to help open their eyes that they might see. I don't know what God's dealing with your heart about tonight, but whatever it is, you can come around and pray around this altar. 
You know what? Make friends with the altar. The altar needs to be our friend. Amen? It needs to be our friend. So whatever God's dealing with you tonight, you just move as we begin to sing. Look, Brother Mike. Thank you. 